Okay, I understand. Uh, if you look at this slide that's up on the screen, we wanted to show you the context that supports our meeting today. Uh, the process started uh, with an advisory board, moved to a community working group, moved to a task force, and then CVR was hired as a consultant. We came on site in June, and since June, we've had approximately 30 meetings with a variety of stakeholders over the course of four trips. Our first engagement was really just to listen. Back in June, we had eight meetings over the course of three days. We called them listening sessions. And we wanted to make sure that we understood the context in which we were hired. So that was a great foundation for doing our fact finding. Next. So we have a contract with the Housing Authority, and we wanted to explain our scope of services. We were hired to evaluate two options, known as option one and option two. Option one was titled historic preservation. Option two was titled mixed income. With those options, our task was to determine the best and most feasible revitalization scenarios. In a sense, we were to take these options and turn them into scenarios. During that time, we tried to understand the context in which both options was delivered to us. And we looked at the opportunities and challenges of both options, and there were many. And ultimately, with our experience, we were to evaluate and enhance both options. Now we're going to go through about a 45 minute presentation, but I want to zoom to give you a preview of our finding. Our finding is based in a scenario called Scenario B. And Scenario B is a scenario that meets the number one goal of the community working group, which is to protect existing Golden Gate households. Scenario B ensures that Golden Gate Village residents stay in Golden Gate Village. And I want to repeat that. I want to make sure that that is heard with great clarity. Scenario B ensures that Golden Gate Village residents stay in Golden Gate Village. They stay so their kids can continue to go to the same schools. They stay so they can go to church. They can stay in their neighborhood with their neighbors. Scenario B also includes honoring the historic character of the community. And it also integrates green technologies. So now we'll go on a journey to find out how we got to Scenario B. And if you go to the next slide. The foundation of our whole process was based on meeting these six goals. And this is from a community working group session back in January of 2015. I guess three years ago. And you can see the number one goal there, protect existing Golden Gate households. And that was our guiding light. That was our North Star. Go to the next slide, please. We wanted to comment on the community engagement process. We have had the opportunity to meet many people and forge some what I would call strong relationships. I got an email during this uh, comment period from one that said, you know, Dan, when you explain the community engagement process, speak the truth. Don't gloss it over. So it was challenging to try to come up with a simple way to describe the community engagement process, and we tried. It was vigorous. It was highly spirited. At times, it was truly challenging. And this was due to the emotion and the feeling that everyone wanted to do the right thing. But boy, were there a variety of options there and a variety of voices. So it was a bumpy ride. So we're not glossing this over. And you can see this by the participation in the audience. This is an emotionally charged issue. But we were hired to do a job. And as Radeep mentioned, we've done this before. And we tried to bring some of our experience to bear. So next slide. Next slide. So um, as Pradeep mentioned, our report was 134 pages. But even for someone who was engaged in this process, that's a bit long. So what we did is we bifurcated the report into two parts. There's a 58-page report 
and then there is a 70 plus page appendix. The appendix has all these different deep dives into the background of Marin City, review of resident provided sources. I won't list all those, you can look at them on the PowerPoint. But as you go through the 58 page uh, report, and you want to get more information on any one of these issues, whether it's community land trust or the manufacturing hub, we really touched all the bases here because we were given a lot of bases to touch. And if you take the time and not to skim through, you'll find it either in the report or in the appendix. So starting... All right, we're missing a slide, technical issue, but we'll go with that. <laughs> Technology. Um, we wanted to start on uh, one of the foundational items of understanding the scenario, and that is one of the largest cost items, which is the construction cost of the project. The construction cost was based on an instrument called a PNA, which is a physical needs assessment, a requirement that the Housing Authority has for every five years to judge the useful life and the replacement of items that are situated on campus and in the buildings. When we arrived on the site and looked at the PNA, it had an immediate value of first year repairs of $16 million. And when we looked through some of the documents of this uh, process, it appeared that the $16 million was all that this project would cost. But that really wasn't the full story. Using the uh, expertise of CSG and CBR's experience, what a PNA does is it looks at the replacement of items over a long period of time. And when you're doing a development project of this scale, it's customary to look at 20 years. So it wasn't just the first year replacement items that was 16 million. We had to look at replacement items up to 20 years, including items like boilers that almost come in at a million dollars a piece. So the real number of the PNA was $24 million, $16 million the first year, $8 million over the next 19 years or so. Now, if you look at this stack, and uh, it's color-coded, so that it's nice to read, I believe people have handouts. The $24 million is identified by the red, the base, right there. But then we had to work with that number. First thing we had to do, we had to add inflation, because the PNA was done in 2015, and if this project gets going, let's say 2000. Maybe. We had to add a percentage for inflation. That's the next stack, three million. But I'd like to focus on the green stack, the one that says 16 million. A standard PNA just replaces items that are situated on campus or in the buildings. It's not aspirational and not necessarily far reaching to what we heard from our 30 meetings, including those uh, from the residents directly. The $16 million in green there are identified in great detail in the report, but I'm going to touch on a few of them. The PNA did not include information regarding stormwater management and erosion control. Uh, in the last day or so, you can imagine on this hillside uh, what challenges that we face in that regard. While we're here, we've seen a mudslide, we've seen erosion all over the place. The PNA also didn't include restoration of the landscaping which we heard on more than one occasion from the residents. We also included hazardous material abatement that wasn't in the PNA. Seismic review, especially of the high rises. Uh, historical preservation attributes, and I'll get into that in a moment when we talk about the wonderful process of historic designation. So when you add up all those items, that was a significant amount of money. That was 16 million. If you finish up the stack there, the blue and the yellow, those are the contractor's costs to produce that work. And that added up to 50 million. On top of that, the 12.6 million were various what's called soft costs, non-construction costs. So one of the pieces of information we delivered in this journey was that this was not a $16 million project. This was a $63 million project. And at that scale and magnitude, it gives some great insight in how contractors can put $63 million worth of work onto that hillside. <coughs> More about that later. Next slide. Fardeep is now going to talk about the challenges of housing authorities across the country in meeting these requirements. 
I think one of the things that is important to note is that what is happening here um, is a microcosm of, call it neglect, call it um, issues of deferred maintenance that have not been able to be addressed is a national problem. It is not exclusively a problem to Golden Gate Village. Um, nationally, um, the amount of funding that Congress has given HUD, and therefore the amount of funding that HUD has given housing authorities, has continued to decline for decades now. Um, over the last 10 years, HUD has, in the case of the Marin Housing Authority, cut its funding for a total of over 20, two, I mean, $227,000 less um, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, this is a problem that is national. Um, as you see, one of the bullets on that slide talks about the national needs. Uh, in 2014, we're estimated to be $26 billion of deferred maintenance for public housing across the country. And at the same time, the current budget for addressing that for all housing authorities is $2 billion. So that is, was four years ago. That number is substantially higher today. Um, as part of a recognition by Congress and by HUD that there is a problem that is not being able to be addressed, one of the things that has happened is HUD has looked at providing options such as allowing for mixed finance, something that traditionally didn't happen, but allowing for mixed finance redevelopment, <coughs> um, different programs, project-based vouchers, and the rental assistance demonstration program, which we'll talk more about in a moment. We could go to the next slide. Basically, um, when you look at this, you're seeing the 60 plus million dollars of need for Golden Gate Village. Um, and yet, you have to look at that in, in the context that the Marine Housing Authority received approximately $800,000 a year in capital funds for all of its properties. Uh, clearly, uh, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that that is so little money to even begin to make any of the necessary repairs. Um, one thing that I did want to know that is important, um, and it, it forms part of our recommendation process, is that Public housing, as it has traditionally been known and, and as it exists, uh, is covered by a declaration of trust for the benefit of HUD. Uh, that is a legal document at the Registry of Deeds. You cannot put any liens on it. You cannot borrow. You cannot put debt. You are restricted to operating public housing under the guidelines of something called the Annual Contributions Contract, which is the legal document that controls the relationship between HUD and housing authorities in their management of public housing. And you're only allowed to utilize the funds that HUD gives you in different programs within the guidelines of those programs. So you are very restricted. As I um, mentioned to Lewis and to a number of our meetings, um, even if you gave, someone came along and wrote a check for the $60 million for going to go, you would have to go to HUD. You would not be allowed to just accept that money to put it into the Golden Gate Village because there are severe restrictions on how you operate under that declaration of trust. Um, we could go on. I think. So we're going to talk about, excuse me, we'll now talk about our approach. So it's interesting, the last few slides were all about money, right? This project is much more than just about money. And we use a process that we call our ESP framework that shows the economics of a project must be in balance with the social goals and the physical goals in order to be sustainable. So this is not just about the money. So if you go to the next slide, here's the way that we describe some of the economic goals, the social goals, and the physical goals. I'll just briefly touch on them. Economically, <coughs> this must have a financial analysis that is real and that works. That means the sources that can be put to this project are very real. And Fredeek is actually going to go into that in a, in a few moments. From a social standpoint, we talked about the number one goal again of the community working group, and that is to protect Golden Gate Village households. Again, the number one goal. Um, also with that is the continuation of a community participation process that started over nine years ago. Um, we must have that continuing. 
So a project that doesn't include those two social goals isn't really a project at all. And then finally, physically, uh, we touched on the PNA review, but uh, the bottom bullet point, just to take a moment, was something that happened during this process, and that was the um, approval of putting the site on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the impassioned speaker here at the beginning of this meeting called this the land of opportunity. The idea that a grassroots effort started by residents could put together a document that was technically, socially, and even emotionally uh, describing the love of this site. And to read that document um, was a great introduction to get considerable insight into the special nature of this site. And, you know, for people who understand the National Register of Historic Places, it's not just about beautiful buildings or uh, memorable and important historically uh, important buildings, but there's a great social component to the application. And you read the depth of that application to the social importance. Um, it was breathtaking. And I would say that that became a central portion of trying to come up with a scenario that respects, not only respects that, but enhances that. Uh, we have ideas that um, can even take that a step forward. Um, so now I'm going to give it up to, for Deke, and he's going to go over some terms. Because what you find in this environment, there are acronyms and there's slang, and he's going to try to hit on a few of them that will be important to this uh, presentation. Thanks, Dan. Um, I just mentioned we have three slides that we uh, try to provide you some description of what the different terminology that we use in the report and, and sometimes in our presentations and speaking. Um, I mentioned the Declaration of Trust. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you. I do want to note that tax credits um, is a very significant one in the, most people have recognized low-income housing tax credits and historic tax credits. Obviously, the, the one that gets you the most bang for the buck is the 9% low-income housing tax credits that allows you to do the most in terms of rehabilitation or redevelopment of, of any housing. Um, and this is something that cannot be done under the Declaration of Trust and uh, ACC have public housing. Um, the project-based vouchers, if you could go to the next slide, please. The project-based vouchers um, are essentially, I think most people are familiar with what they call Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, and that is a voucher that a person or a family receives and it allows them to utilize that voucher as rental assistance in any private housing. Um, Project-based vouchers, instead of being tied to an individual or a family, are tied to a unit. Um, so the subsidy flows to that unit regardless of whether the resident is, you know, Ms. Smith or Mr. Jones. Um, when that person moves, the, the subsidy attached to that project-based voucher stays with that unit. And what is important about that is that it is one of the vehicles that can be used to guarantee uh, affordability for that unit as well as to project income, net operating income for part of that project and for those units for 20 years. Um, finally, we could go to the next slide. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program known as RAD. Um, this is a vehicle that HUD uh, initiated as a um, demonstration program at the beginning in 2009, uh, the beginning of the Obama administration, um, with a sense by then Secretary Sean Donovan that uh, traditional public housing was not um, working and being managed in the best way possible because of the restrictions that come with it, and he wanted to initiate a model program that would allow the housing authorities uh, to convert the traditional public housing to the RAP program while protecting residents. It allows public housing residents to remain in the exact same units that they're in, paying the exact same rent that they're paying, um, but it allows the housing authority, it doesn't provide any more money, doesn't provide any additional funds come with it, but it allows the housing authority to receive the programs that it currently receives, capital funds, operating subsidy, 
all together in a lump and to use it as they wish. Whereas for right now, housing authorities restricted, for example, capital funds have their restrictions on how they must be used. Operating subsidy has its restrictions on how it must be used. Um, housing choice voucher program, if it's rendering the housing authority a profit, housing authority is not allowed to take that and utilize it to make capital repairs on public housing. So the RAD program allows that greater flexibility. Uh, more significantly, it allows housing authorities to leverage funds. So while you cannot do it in ACC, traditional public housing, under the RAD program, you're allowed to apply for and obtain tax credits or utilize project-based vouchers um, so that you can utilize those funds, get debt, fix up units, do whatever rehabilitation or new redevelopment you may want to do. And that's a significant factor. Um, for housing as it's being, it, 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 many people are seeing it as uh, 21st century public housing, allowing housing authorities to have greater flexibility with its funding. Um, Dan? So we're coming into the home stretch. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about our findings. And we're not going to jump to scenario B. We're going to show you the process that we went through because process is very important, especially when you have. 30 community meetings and you have to try to explain each step along the way. So, as stated um, <clears throat> in our contract, our starting point were the concepts that were identified in option one and option two. Option one being historic rehabilitation and option two being mixed income. We looked at both of them. On option one, we deemed it infeasible. It was infeasible due to the funding restrictions and the funding gap, but it was also infeasible due to the sense of displacement. And we just want to describe that. Option one was a complete rehabilitation of the existing site. As discussed earlier, that was a $50 million construction project. When a contractor and developer team is faced with applying $50 million over 32 acres, it's a magnitude that is larger than anything Golden Gate Village have ever went through before and necess necessitated a phasing approach because you can't just do the whole project at once. In looking at the relationship with the high rises and the low rises, as well as the topography, we estimated that the rehabilitation project would be between four or five phases. During that time, large quadrants of the site would essentially be cordoned off and shut down because of safety reasons and the fact that we have to deal with site issues such as stormwater management, utilities, paving, grading, all that stuff. What that translated to in option one was between 60 to 80 households would have to be moved off site during the construction of that phase. Those phases would last anywhere from one to two years each. So the question is, how do you find a solution for 60 to 80 households to rent new places in Marin County? Marin County has an absorption rate right now of 98% for all rental units. The math doesn't work. So what it showed us was that under option one, those 60 to 80 households most likely would be asked to be relocated outside of Marin County, where they're away from their schools, away from their church, away from their neighbors, and then to come back. History has shown with this type of construction phasing, it can dissemble or disassemble a neighborhood. So for those two reasons, the funding reason and the displacement reason, option one was not considered feasible. Option two had really just two words behind it, mixed income. There was no plan, there was no physical or financial metrics given to mixed income. The option was literally mixed income. Faced with that, we had to determine if economics was the driving force behind mixed income, what would be, what would transpire? 
And what would transpire would probably be a demolition of the entire site and putting up a brand new mixed income project. Well, obviously that was unfeasible due to the historic nature of the site. But mixed income and historic rehabilitation had themes, not necessarily, not necessarily detailed and comprehensive plans, but they had themes that were very important. The theme of historic rehabilitation, the theme of green technology, the theme of trying to get mixed income in order to open up funding sources that would make these scenarios feasible were very interesting. And that's how we transitioned from the two options to looking at scenarios. We took the themes from those options. We actually identified six scenarios. And the six scenarios are listed on the slide. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, describe them. Again, in the report, there's great detail on each one of these, both in the report and the appendices. Just as a summary of the six options, when we looked at, or six scenarios, excuse me, when we looked at them in greater detail, the first four scenarios we deemed infeasible. And then we took scenario five and scenario six to a very deep level of analysis. Scenario five became renamed as scenario A, and scenario six became renamed as scenario B. So let's get started. On scenario one, that was continuing the funding of the conventional HUD funding program and doing incremental repairs and replacement. Scenario two, was what we called a comprehensive mixed income, mixed finance redevelopment. Now comprehensive is the word that we'd like to focus on. In comprehensive mixed finance, we would be demolishing the entire site, but we would be converting this to a RAD funding, as what uh, Fredeek was calling the 21st century concept of public housing. Number three, was stepping down the idea, of, the idea of demolition to say we're going to preserve the high rises only, but to redevelop the low rises in a mixed income profile, also with a RAD funding. Scenario four was taking the project into a new funding program, as Fredeek mentioned, which is called project-based vouchers. Now those four uh, scenarios, we have slides coming up to talk about how we actually looked at each of them. Scenario five is taking the existing site as is and doing a complete green rehabilitation, but using RAD conversion as the funding. So again, the RAD conversion would open us up to other funding sources that are not here right now in the conventional HUD funding program. And scenario six, the operative word is partial. Partial redevelopment. Now the way that you can look at the word partial, you could link that to scenario three, which said preservation of site high rises, and you could link it to the word comprehensive in scenario two. These are in descending magnitude of replacement of some of the existing housing. So where scenario two was a scenario that said, we're going to redevelop the entire site, and obviously we deemed that infeasible. Scenario three was redeveloping a portion of the site, which was just the low rises, which we also termed infeasible. Scenario six is a partial redevelopment in the low rise area. Now, one thing that uh, we will point out as we go forward, our contract did not include us doing physical planning to actually work out the site design and architectural design of what a partial redevelopment was, nor did it include extensive financial modeling that says these are the specific number of units and these are the specific costs. We were hired to do a feasibility study 
And as we go forward, we'll show you how we use the metrics of scenario six, which becomes scenario B, in a very rational way to determine the number of units. So this was a very important slide. What Fergie's going to do now, or actually, if you go to the next slide, um, before I get to you on the financial feasibility, we talked about the ESG framework. And this is the framework that we try to review and analyze those six scenarios, the S and P. The first uh, filter had to be economic viability. If the funding wasn't there, the scenario had to be deemed infeasible because this is not an academic exercise. We have a real need to do something. Doing something is doing nothing is not an option here. We are in a process of continued deterioration every single day. So we had to do something, and that something began to be predicated on having financial feasibility. From a social standpoint, we had to ensure that the scenario did not have any involuntary displacement, which means we had to ensure that Golden Gate Village, Golden Gate Village residents could stay at Golden Gate Village. That was certainly the number one social filter that we used, and to continue working into a community process. And the last one, the physical filter, was that there could not be substantial physical change that would alter the historic designation. And this is something that we just want to point out. Historic designation, although a wonderful process that honors the importance of the site, does not preclude partial redevelopment. There are historic sites that do allow partial redevelopment. It has to be done in a very exacting and critical process, but it does not preclude that. We just want to point that out, and we go into that in more detail in the report. So if you go to the next slide, Fredeep is going to dive into financial feasibility because it's not as simple as just having the money. There's a time element to that, and uh, Fredeep will explain that. Well, basically, what is significant is obviously there isn't enough funding um, for affordable housing, and that, that's a critical issue. You hear about different sources, but what's important is to understand that whatever funding one might be looking for is going to be appropriate for what is needed here, or more importantly, the requirements that HUD places are going to be aligned uh, for the different funding sources to be able to be competitive. Um, are you going to be able to have a continuum of um, funding? Is there a likelihood of that? So for example, um, we estimate that any activity here would probably be undertaken over a course of five phases, and this would be numerous years over the course of those five phases. So a funding source that is likely to only be available one time is not something that is very viable. We we're looking at sources that at the moment, and obviously anything can change, but that at the moment look like they would be viable resources for MHA to pursue over multiple years. Um, also important that we be competitive. Um, tax credits, for example, are competitive. You need to be looking at some of the different programs that might be available. There are federal home loan bank programs. Um, are we competitive for those? Is Golden Gate Village and its needs uh, competitive for those funding uh, applications? And that um, the gaps that exist, uh, there are significant gaps, and you're going to see there are eight figure gaps. Um, but are they realistically um, gaps that can be narrowed and that can be eliminated in the process? So all of those factors were important when we were looking at what was financial viability. So now we come to the scorecard. <clears throat> so what you see here are scenarios one through six listed through the field filters of ESP. And uh, during this presentation, we mentioned some of these. Um, you can see that the top four were deemed infeasible. You can see that in the right column where it says no, no, no. The first one, as we talked about, I won't have to belabor that, is that there was a significant economic gap, and also uh, there was not a solution to avoid displacement uh, for residents during the construction period. The second one, which was comprehensive, which meant uh, 
the demolition of the entire site to get an economically rich mixed income outcome, uh, from a physical standpoint, was just infeasible. We saw that as a non-starter, um, especially with the process that is here. Uh, number three, um, which steps down the redevelopment to just include the low rises, we also considered infeasible for the same reason. What's interesting about the low rises to the uninitiated who maybe just drive by Golden Gate Village, the low rises look uh, more common than the high rises. The high rises are statuesque, iconic looking structures and to the passerby uh, seem special. But after walking around the site numerous times, engaging residents, it's not just the buildings of the low rises that are magnificent, it's the spaces between. It's the social spaces that were the genius of Lawrence Halpern to create residential courtyards with public-private patios between the courtyards and the buildings that allow ten families to engage. At the time that this was developed, this was unheard of in the design of public housing. Public housing resembled barracks, like tissue boxes that were just laid in a parallel way and no designation of social space. You were either in your unit or out on the sidewalk. No public space. This was groundbreaking site design. So um, I won't take the rest of the time going into this, but you can tell this uh, idea of redeveloping all the low rises, uh, we did not deem feasible for that reason. And then from a scenario four, using project-based vouchers, although project-based vouchers are an option, they're not really feasible from an economic standpoint. Um, and that's not my bailiwick, but that goes into great detail in the report. So we're left with scenario five and scenario six. Scenario five, uh, which is doing a comprehensive re rehabilitation, but different than option one, it's using RAD conversion for funding, we took a deep dive into. And scenario six, which became scenario B, um, which was partial redevelopment. Um, and again, I will talk to you about how we came up with the density for that and re rehabilitation with Brad allows Golden Gate Village residents to stay on site during construction. You may ask, well, how does that happen? And we'll use the term to make that clear. It's called a build first strategy. A build first strategy. So if scenario B includes some new units, those new units allowing some mixture of income, those new units would be built during phase one. We would find, or not we, the next uh, development stage would find spaces on site that would allow a number of units to be built without altering the historic integrity of the campus. Those new units will be finished and ready for occupancy before the first phase of rehabilitation. So when we quadrant off the site and we have 60 to 80 households that have to be taken out of their units in order to rehab that quadrant, where do they go? They stay on site in the new construction. The build first mentality was the inflection point on making scenario be feasible. And we'll get into that in more detail. Next. So Rajiv is now going to go into the detail. Do you like my transitions? You, not too much. You can introduce the screen every time. Um, Dan gets a little passionate about the architectural <laughs> stuff, if you didn't notice. Um, we're ultimately then down to the two scenarios that we deem to be feasible. Um, Scenario A, a comprehensive green rehabilitation and RAD conversion. Scenario B, a partial redevelopment and green rehabilitation with RAD conversion. Obviously, what is significant about both is that we're saying RAD conversion. And to take you back for a moment um, about the significance of that is that without the RAD conversion, keeping the property as traditional ACC public housing you will not be able to utilize any of the vehicles for bringing in tax credit, getting construction loans, do anything, whether it be for any redevelopment or any rehabilitation. You will be restricted 
to utilizing whatever funding HUD gives you for capital funds. And I'll remind you right now that was, and it has been a declining number that HUD has been giving housing authorities. And for MHA, it's been at approximately $800,000 per year for all of its properties. Uh, and you're facing a 60 plus million dollar redevelopment need. Um, so we could go to the next slide. Scenario A, um, we're looking at converting to RAD, where you keep all 296 units and all 296 <coughs> families residing there in their units. They stay in the same unit and they pay the same amount of rent that they currently pay, 30% of their income would be. If it's zero, it's zero. If it's $10, it's $10. Whatever it is, they pay the same rent. Um, what is significant is that you would now be able to utilize other resources. You could go after tax credits to do the rehabilitation, um, and you would be able to incorporate green technologies. You would be able to access debt, so if you need a construction loan, you can do those things under RAD. Um, we go to the next slide. We then took a look at what would this entail um, to do the rehabilitation of the 296 units. Uh, obviously, as Dan referenced, it is a very substantial undertaking, and it would have to be phased. It's anything that's too large. Um, so it would have to be phased, we estimate, in five phases. Um, the work would be done getting a combination of tax credits, uh, private debt, and we're looking at a cost of rehabilitation of some $96.5 million um, with the fees and the different things that would, would be required. This leaves an ex, uh, a gap of about $25 million, which is very significant. Um, but that's probably not the most significant aspect from our estimation of why we don't ultimately recommend this scenario. So go to the next slide, that, please. Um, we listed here what are the benefits and challenges um, of scenario A, and I'm not going to read them for you, but I do think that if you look at the last bullet of the challenges, the fact that when you are phasing, as Dan referenced earlier, you are going to have to move some 60 to 80 families per phase for a period of one to two years while substantive rehabilitation takes place. We're not talking about carpeting and windows and cabinetry. We're talking about building systems. We're talking about roofs and sewage lines, as well as all of the issues that undertake any major community. And, and this one needs them badly, as, as Dan referenced. We've seen events happen just in the period of time we've been working here. Where could you locate 60 to 80 families, even with a temporary voucher in Marin County? We felt that that ultimately is the main reason why we cannot be comfortable recommending this and honor what has been told to us as one of the most significant um, issues, which is keeping everybody on the site. So we go to scenario B, which is what we ultimately present to you as the board um, as what we feel is the scenario that provides the best opportunity to effectively reestablish, rehabilitate this site and keep the residents on the site. Uh, again, it would require converting to the RAD program. Um, it would allow you to access debt and tax credit equity, um, allow for the 296 families, again, to remain on the site, paying the same rent they do, um, but we are looking at a partial redevelopment by adding some units. And we did an example here, again, we received no specific guidelines from the housing authority, so we looked at some zoning, and this is purely an example. You could go higher, you could go lower, you could change it. Part of our example and our financial modeling for this was utilizing project-based vouchers, some low-income housing tax credits, and let me, and, and some market rate. Let me address a few things. Um, under, when you look at low-income housing tax credits, for example, there is 
income tiering even within the low income housing tax credit program. You can have tiering from zero to 30% of area median income, from 30 to 60, from 60 to 80% of area median income. So you can have mixed income even without that, within the just low income housing tax credit component. Uh, one of the things that is significant, and we heard at meetings, we, we heard uh, people who formerly lived on the site saying, uh, I'd love to be living in this community, but I'm making too much money to be in public housing. Plus, I believe the public housing waiting list is closed. Um, we, we're really in a situation where we can't live here because we're making too much money, but we'd, live, we'd love to be part of that. Well, there may be opportunities for people who are making perhaps more than, than you would allow you to qualify for public housing, but still be affordable and live within the site. And as Dan said, we would be looking at making these additional units. They would all be built to the same standard. There would be no distinction, and that's one of the components of any mixed finance redevelopment within HUD, uh, whether it's RAD or not, or whatever you're doing. You're building all to one standard, uh, which is essentially a market rate standard. Regardless of who's living there, you would keep the 296 units um, of a currently ACC housing under the RAP program, but protected for public housing residents. And then you would be bringing in additional units, which would be the ones, as Dan referenced in his build first uh, commentary, that would be used when you first start doing the rehabilitations. That's where you move the current residents to. So they stay on the site. They have to vacate their units so they can be rehabilitated, but they'd be able to stay on the Golden Gate Village site in these new units. If we could go to the next slide, um, we did some financial modeling as well on, on this concept. Again, uh, any project here we envision is, is a five-phase project, and five-phase means five multi-year phases of, of work to be conducted. Um, again, this would be a combination of low-income housing tax credits and other financial components that you could not do under traditional public housing. Um, the total cost with the new units and everything else were estimated at nearly $140 million, um, which leaves us with a gap of 18, almost $19 million, a very significant gap. Um, nevertheless, when you divide that by five phases, um, you're making it a more manageable gap. And part of our recommendation is that MHA look to uh, through a process, a procurement process, and a request for qualifications, look for developer partners that are experienced, whether they be for-profit or not-for-profit. And that is one of the main things that developers do, look to close the funding gaps that may exist on a, on a deal. So whether they're getting additional applications from HUD or the Federal Home Loan Bank, or looking at additional equity, um, those, we feel, would be more manageable. We can go to the next slide. Again, we've tried to list the benefits and the challenges. Um, going to that RAD program, you still have to, you have to apply for it, although applying for it is essentially submitting a letter. And let me give you a little bit of context, because I know that it is something a lot of people have talked about but are not too familiar with all of the issues. Uh, as I said, RAD began in 2009. Initially, there were 60,000 units allowed to be in the RAD program to be converted to the RAP program. Uh, that was then raised, that immediately got filled up, and that was then raised to 180,000. It's now been raised to 225,000. It is pretty much the only thing that HUD is moving these days, is saying, if you're going to RAP, we feel this, you know, we will expedite that process for you, and they envision continuing to allow the number of units that convert to the RAP program to increase. Um, this is, a, they are making, they're streamlining some of their other requirements in order to allow housing authorities to convert to RAP. And just so that you have a little context, there are many agencies that are doing, uh, uh, some of which we work with. So for example, the Tampa Housing Authority, Santa Fe, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts has converted all of its public housing, or is in the process of converting all of its public housing to the RAP program. So it, it, while it is not um, yet happening everywhere. Many agencies have recognized that they need to go there in order to fill the needs that they have because the reality is the funding isn't likely to be coming from the federal government. 
also the conclusion, uh, which we've mentioned, I will not read these, but the conclusion of scenario B is the build for a strategy allows residents to stay on site. And it incorporates several themes from option one, including honoring history and the architectural significant, including green technologies. And if you go to the next slide, we were asked to talk about uh, what would be the next steps in this process. The first step is that you would initiate an RFQ process to procure a development partner that continues to work with the community to come up with a detailed development plan. That process would include looking at what would be the total number of new units to ensure the build first strategy that keeps all the residents on site. What are the funding sources? What are the specific gaps that need to be met? Second step in the upper right is continuing the participatory community process that started back in 2009. That must be a requirement for any development partner that comes in. Bless you. In the bottom left, uh, during that process is applying for the RAD program. We think that is a 21st century HUD funding program that the uh, project is based on. And then the bottom right is continue to reach out and build relationships with other stakeholders because this is certainly about Golden Gate Village, but it's also about Marin City, it's about Marin County and the state of California. This is a significant project, there are a lot of eyes watching this, and continuing to build those stakeholder relationships are important. Next slide. And when you go to that RFQ for development partners, uh, these are the recommended principles for those activities, including honoring history, focusing on no involuntary displacement, making sure things are financially feasible, incorporating green technologies, seeking ways to incorporate innovative job training, which was a, a theme from option one that was fascinating. And there's a whole section in the appendix on the research we did for that. And continuing to engage the residents in the community. So at this point, we thank you for your time in trying to go through 140 pages. And we went over 45 minutes by about 10 minutes. We apologize for that. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add one last thing, which is to say that um, Dan alluded to um, during the presentation. Um, there's a risk of doing nothing. Um, but doing nothing has consequences. This property is deteriorating. And to do nothing um, and to rely on whatever funding may come from the federal government, which you currently know is inadequate, um, is not a, it's a recipe for eventual significant problems. So we urge you to consider uh, continuing moving forward. There's been a lot of progress made compared to many housing authorities that are saying we've got to do something. You've done a lot of planning. You have a lot of work already laid out which would make you a very good candidate for moving forward in a, in a more expeditious manner. So, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I also wanted to note that uh, in addition to the comments we received, uh, we should have also received clarifications to the revitalization feasibility assessment that should have been given to you as well, and it's been made available to the public also with just clarifications to the uh, Thank you, and uh, thank you for the report. So before we move to public comment, I'll look to see if there are any questions from commissioners. Looking to my right. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was very helpful in trying to condense a very long and detailed report. I do have a question, and it relates to slide 12, uh, which was the assessment of physical needs. And it's possible that you covered this, and I missed it, uh, because the slide's out with a lot of numbers. Uh, and my question in particular, uh, this is on the last bullet point uh, in the first large bullet point section where it says you added 7% for general conditions uh, costs and a total of 3.3 million. And I wonder if you could help us understand what general conditions refers to. Sure, if you want to. Uh, sure. Sure. So as part of the uh, construction contract, um, HUD does allow specific fees to be added. Um, they cover the contractor for any overruns in terms of time and things like that, plus um, 
you, you know, the profit to to the contractor for the work. And so HUD is capping that at 14%, which is what we reflect here. Great, thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. I have one. Um, on rental assistance demonstration, or RAD, um, the material suggests that it's, it's a competitive program. Um, there's, a, there's a cap on uh, participation. How realistic is it that we would be able to qualify this project for that? Well, um, it is competitive in the sense that um, you have to go through a process. Many housing authorities are simply sending in a, a one-page letter saying, we want to be in RAD, put us on the list. But they've got nothing yet to show for it. We do work with agencies um, in helping them formulate plans to go forward. Um, that cap has continued to increase. Um, so, for example, um, El Paso Housing Authority, I think, was 7,000 units that they're converting the entire housing authority to, to the RAD program. And as they have hit that cap, they have, HUD has increased it. Uh, what is also taking place is HUD issues you, um, or issues an agency that says here, whether it's the entire portfolio or one particular property, um, you submit to HUD the, the details of what that is. Uh, and they can issue a, a um, what's called a CHAP, essentially a contract for housing assistance payments. Um, if you are, what's happening is those housing authorities are not ready to move forward expeditiously, HUD is pulling it back and saying, get back in line, and we're going to award it to those. We've got somebody else who's moving it forward. We do feel that the amount of work that has already been put into place in terms of planning, in terms of community participation, which many housing authorities don't have um, together yet, uh, would better position the Marine Housing Authority to be able to say, we've got dire needs here, and we've got the only vehicle that you're allowing us to utilize to make this happen. So we feel quite candidly is your best option. And then in terms of the, the uh, funding gaps that you've identified and the commitment to closing those gaps, could you elaborate a little bit more? What, what are some of the strategies that can be used to close uh, the gap? So one of the things that, and, and there are always uncertainties. Uh, so one of the things that happens is that you go for a 9% tax credit, um, which are the best ones to, because they bring in the most equity. Um, and can be utilized for rehabilitation and uh, new construction. Um, depending on any given moment, and this is not the best moment, uh, a year ago was better, um, the equity raises or the amount of uh, money that corporations would pay to acquire tax credits um, is, is a significant component of how much money is coming in. Um, Prior to President Trump saying, when he first announced, uh, as soon as he was elected, that he was going to lower the corporate tax rate, that immediately brought equity raises down. <coughs> as during the course of the year, uh, as it became clear that no law was going to go into place for 2017, uh, those equity raises went back up a bit. But they were not the same as they were. Obviously, the tax rate has been effectively lowered from a total, a maximum of 35% to 20% for corporations. So they have less incentive. <coughs> to invest. That said, there are still corporations that believe it's the right thing to do. And also, <coughs> particularly banks, and I'm going to say the Bank of America is one of the biggest players in the affordable housing investments uh, world, um, have community um, reinvestment act obligations. So even though they have less incentive from a corporate tax rate, they also have other obligations from their banking obligations, uh, which has kept the tax credit program going. I think while it has affected the level of investment, it's not like it's gone away. And even this year, many deals were closed at, at about 90 cents on the tax credit dollar. Uh, in addition, there are programs such as the uh, affordable housing program from the Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, which is competitive, but again, always looks at significant deals that have uh, the ability to, to have an impact in their communities, and we certainly feel this is one of those. Um, so I do believe that there are numerous strategies that would be available to, again, an experienced developer, whether it be for-profit or not-for-profit, to close those gaps. And 
while we did reference the $19 million gap, when you divide that by five phases, you've now reduced it significantly for each phase. Great. So final question, um, as you're aware, risk of displacement is a concern, if not the main concern, of Golden Gate residents. Um, you stated that the uh, plan ensures that Golden Gate residents stay in Golden Gate Village, in effect that there is zero displacement. Um, I think what we'd like to know is how, how realistic is that some have suggested it is high in the sky, uh, but obviously that is something that would be a precondition to going forward, that kind of commitment. So how is it done? Basically, um, what happens is that you negotiate terms for your right deal. Different housing authorities have negotiated a different terms. I will tell you that there are some who have negotiated a 20-year term, 40-year term, and 99-year term. So you can negotiate what you want. There are communities that are feel is very important, and this clearly would be one, um, where costs are so high that it's important to guarantee long-term affordable housing opportunities. So you can negotiate, for example, as I said, whatever amount you negotiate with. This is, this is a complicated process. You're going to have uh, different deals. You're going to have investors. Everybody's going to have their attorney. The housing authority would have its attorney negotiating what are the terms that the housing authority demands uh, in order to, to make this RAP conversion. But the program does allow for the residents to stay and to pay the same level of rent. If in that process a resident leaves, that unit stays essentially the same affordable unit at that same former public housing level. It does not convert to a market rate unit or anything else. So you guarantee that. Uh, I think Tanya wants to add something. Sorry, <laughs> I do. So, so the build for strategy is not unique. Is not a, a unique proposal to you know for us for Golden Gate Village. We see this across the country okay, as as you know as housing has evolved and the housing programs have evolved over time. This has been a you know paramount issue for HUD across the country. And RAD, in particular, does a better job than it than the previous Hope Six properties and programs, you know, that preceded it, because it ensures the residents' right to return. And in addition, you know, just down down the road, in, in the, the the LA Housing Authority, they are also undergoing a 400 unit massive redevelopment strategy. And we also recommended a build first, and that's exactly what they're doing. They have multiple phases for which they've completed one phase already. And so I think, you know, based on our experience, we believe that a build first strategy where tenants are not um, relocated off site is perfectly reasonable and within the parameters for which you would require a developer to work within. But again, to Verdi's point, part of our recommendations is to take all of the work that we, we, we have and translate that into a document that represents your needs to a developer. And the developer's job will be to work out the fine details of what constraints you place on it. And that's part of the purpose of this as a feasibility study, is to identify where those pain points are and make sure that we're you know, incorporating that into the RFQ for a developer. Great, why don't we uh, move to public comment. Um, if folks could please come up to the microphone. Uh, how many folks want to speak? Just kind of a rough estimate. All right, if, you, if you're able, please line up uh, three minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Barrow. Uh, I know a couple of you quite well, but I'm going to use myself for the rest. I'm a resident of Marin City. I sit on the school board. I've been involved in various community projects in Marin City, including this one for the last couple of years, serving first on the working group and then the task force. Uh, I did not plan to speak first, but I have to leave at 11, so I'm going first. Uh, <laughs> My connection to Golden Gate Village is, again, just a community member, but uh, I'm a third generation resident, and I've had family members who've lived in Golden Gate Village, and a lot of close friends, and uh, um, people I consider colleagues. Um, this important project, I think, is very important to the community, as you all know. 
And I think uh, Mr. Connolly hit on probably the primary concern that I would share, which is displacement of residents and essentially reconstituting the community. Um, I can't speak to the economic piece of this. I'm not an expert on any. I learned a lot in this process, and I realize there's a lot I don't know. So putting that aside, I think the framework that uh, has been suggested of looking at social and physical uh, components makes a lot of sense. My concern is, as I just stated, primarily on the social. And I think you've only been presented with one option that even comes close to addressing that, which is a bill first option in scenario, or was it option scenario, whatever, B. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is, as I understand it, taken from a high level option to a scenario, but it is not a plan. And I think what is needed is specifics of a plan to react to, because there's a lot of uncertainty without that plan. And so I would encourage a planning process, and I would encourage you strongly to eliminate all the other scenarios, because they, as I read them, result in pretty massive displacement, temporarily and likely permanent. Um, on the physical side, you know, I, I don't know how much density that site supports. It looks like this scenario B is a bit of a compromise. You know, if you simplify it down, you leave it as it is, you could remodel it as it is, you could tear it down and build something completely new, and somewhere in the middle feels like this compromise. So there's a lot of questions I have about this. Uh, I don't want to be mistaken as I'm all in and all my questions are answered. But I think you've, you've got one scenario to further develop, and, and it needs further development. Uh, I probably could be more articulate after listening to others, but I will have to leave. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I'm David Levin, uh, managing attorney at Legal Aid in Marin. Thank you very much for your careful attention to this very important issue from Marin County. Uh, we submitted a letter yesterday along with three other uh, legal services and fair housing organizations that identified some serious shortcomings in the report. I'll just briefly mention those points included uh, improvements that are needed in the community engagement process. Uh, there needs to be a sharper focus on the fair housing implications of any proposal. We've touched on that here today, but that's just so important. Also, there was a lack of transparency in the economic analysis that lacked a real explanation of the past history and uh, future options, so we can try to analyze that. And, and there needs to be additional focus on training and hiring of the residents at Golden Gate Village so they can benefit. You saw the large built-in profit for the developers, but we need to keep in mind the residents who could also benefit from whatever's done there. We did have a serious concern about the report being released just before a two-week holiday. You know, this is part of a nine-year process. Very hard to understand how that happened because made uh, responses difficult for a lot of people and organizations. Uh, for example, we would like to look at where the HUD um, uh, investment money is going relative to the other MHA properties, you know, the senior disabled properties, because MHA is responsible for a total of six properties, and, and that's an important issue given the demographics of this situation where the largest concentration of African Americans is in Golden Gate Village in, in Marin City. Also, uh, there, there's two huge uncertainties underneath the proposal. You've already touched on this, but you know the tax legislation last month probably upended <coughs> the low-income housing tax credit uh, program, and that, that's a huge uncertainty, along with the RAD element of this proposal, because currently the waiting list is closed, and there, there are just a lot of uncertainties and questions around how RAD would fit or how it could work and that needs to be examined more carefully. Uh, and, and, and also want to emphasize the obligation for all of us in Marin to uh, do a better job for Golden Gate Village because where we have our representative of Congress putting in a letter yesterday that the conditions of this property are generally unacceptable and in some cases deplorable. We see that regularly at legal aid and we should be doing a better job uh, all of us here in this room, it's good that we're, we're looking at this. We would like to offer our full support. If there's anything we could do or the groups working with us, we'll be happy to be engaged in this process and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Hi, Susan Kirsch from Mill Valley. Um, I want to, first of all, underscore everything that David Levin just said, thinking that that's a really succinct and valuable contribution that he puts into this whole conversation. I guess I'm thinking about today's event being kind of an example of opium addiction. What we see happening is what happens with other people's money. And that this CVR report and hiring CVRs, the consultant seems to be an example of how something that started as a relatively small thing has burgeoned out to be enormous. So we started with a $16 million problem for rehab and, and, and keeping these units livable. So 16 million, that's a big number for all of us. But this escalation has gone from 16 million up to the 50 million, and we see the 158 million. And at the end, with scenario B, we still see that there's the gap of $19 million. So it's like this is escalating. I, I hold the metaphor of this started as a kind of bicycle problem, that we might have started with bicycle tools and simple tools, and now we have a whole fleet of back trucks, trucks that we're trying to deal with that include you know, RAD funding, which admittedly is really uh, high risk, low probability funding. By their own appendix, they write about how RAD funding is highly competitive, cost prohibitive, and requires high thresholds for participation. So it is a risky option to have this is what we move forward with all of the eggs in that basket of RAD conversion. Um, I'd like to speak to, to the idea that in, as I read the contract that CVR had and understand what happened during the last, you know, since 2009, that there was a 21 member committee and huge amounts of community input to, to make that recommendation to look at the housing, the historic preservation, or mixed income housing. And that this group has veered way off into the areas of their expertise, but in that idea of going from simple to big, we went from two options to six scenarios, and with every progression, it gets more and more complicated. You know, my hope, I, I totally agree, something needs to be done. Everybody looks at the properties and understands something needs to be done. There's agreement about that. This process, by not keeping it at the bike, you know, the, the uh, bicycle level and rolling out the whole fleet of Mack trucks, I would like to see pulled back. That there might be the acceptance of this report, but that, that I think we as a community, you as a commission, set of commissioners, are not ready to go forward with the request for qualifications to go to the next step until there is more investigation of scenario B and and or other options, including all of the things the community brought forward in terms of land trust, manufacturing hub, and other options. So I appreciate the consideration. <coughs> Royce Macklemore, Theodore the First Two. Um, just want to quickly say, I, I just saw the clarification in this paper here, if you look at it, and how it was cleverly, the fears were erased to concerns. Uh, just speaking as a resident, it's probably why a lot of people aren't here, because they are truly, truly af afraid. Um, things that I want to just comment on as it relates to this report that the guiding principles that were written down and agreed upon but truly uh, really not followed. Uh, primary points in these principles are to protect the legacy of the community and to put residents at the front of the process. I've heard a lot about you know the historic and this that and the other but this is Golden Gate Village is on the National Historic Registry as a historic district. And it would be the same thing as if, uh, and I've said this some years ago, that the Civic Center has outgrown <coughs> its purpose. But the Board of Supervisors didn't, it didn't cross their mind to tear down the Civic Center and let's build a more modern, new, uh, Civic Center. So, but what you did, you went out throughout the county and purchased land for various services that are provided countywide. This is what we're saying. Go to Gate Village, same Aaron Green. We're not just talking historic, the memories of World War II. We're talking about architectural marble, just like what we're standing in right now. 
and it and it is due the same type of of respect as it relates to and that's why the resident plan came up with historic preservation set on federal precedent now as it relates to the process the process was not followed uh, Susan said it well the process was to equally vet the resident plan and mixed income plan. So we see what happened to the equally vetting of the resident plan. First step. This process was not followed. There were two different standards used. The resident plan, it was critiqued. While an imposing plan, the mixed income, was creating, drawing the best elements of the resident plan. So all you, you've heard about the green this and that, that all came from part of our resident plan. And so like we told Daniel, what, man, what are you doing? You're cherry picking from our plan to put into a plan that you are creating. That is not equally vetting, which means the process was not an equal process. Number two, uh, let me go on to say that as a resident of Marin City, also agree that there is a need for more affordable housing, but affordable housing to be where it's absent. And Marin City is more diverse than any community in Marin County. Marin City USA was our affordable uh, housing answer to 300 plus townhomes. But what you're talking about is the concept of what des disparate impact is about, and we know what that will take us to. And then uh, the people who manage uh, the Aspinall, and I've talked about the Aspinall project, and I have a letter that was dated December 28, 2016, from the lead uh, project manager, and, and he said, and I've never met him personally, he said, overall, the content is, well pre is presented very well. I found documents to be clear, concise, and at a high level, state the goals up front and then elaboration. But if I might sum up an abstract, for the front it would be preservation and modernization of buildings located within the campus, new efficient building systems to replace systems which have exceeded their useful life, uh, implement community work uh, programs to assist in the construction, Etc. When we talked to this man, and we're, you know, and like he said, this sounds like a wonderful project. And he is the GSA, Office of Design and Construction, Senior uh, Project Manager. Well, given our plan, what we presented, and uh, that Daniel thinks was just, oh, a little few little ideas, an expert who had n really no money to what make. Okay, no money, no really monies to get, you know, wealthy off the backs of poor. What he said here versus, you know, people that are getting paid and getting paid well. So I'm, I'm, I'm still in it to win it as it relates to historic preservation uh, because there's federal laws that weren't answered the other night that have to be. Section 106, it's not going to be a walk in the park. Not at all. So I just want you to know that uh, historic preservation give Aaron Green the same respect as Frank Lloyd Wright. Thank you. Hi, Carol Page again. On November 17th, 2017, Lewis Jordan told this board nothing had changed from the original mandate. He then documented the process associated with the CBR report. Mr. Jordan repeated twice, there is no plan. There is no plan. I have read all 58 pages and appendices A through I, and I respectfully disagree. There is a plan. And these gentlemen are speaking the truth. They have done this before. CBR was contractually tasked with the evaluation and enhancement of option one and two. Their report dismiss dismisses both as infeasible. But the task force has apparently passed this breach contract onto you for action. 
CBR's solution to maintaining and rehabilitating Golden Gate Village as public housing is to remove local control, build new units, right. demolish existing units, create opportunities for new consultants and outside contracts, as Golden Gate Village is pushed toward market rate housing through redevelopment. CBR acknowledged the need for creative solutions, private and public investments, and political will in order to offset the stark disparities in equity between Marin City and Marin County. Then, its report ignores creative solutions, denies funding opportunities, and apparently relies on the political will of this board to be utterly lacking. When Mr. Jordan acknowledged material and logistical failures that damaged listening session presentations, he did not apologize for what a resident of Golden Gate Village has suggested were attempts to portray the residents as uncooperative and difficult to work with. Speaking as a taxpayer, I am shocked and ashamed that this wealthy county squanders millions on pet projects while turning away from the needs of the poor, the elderly, and the disabled. The solution is political will and better leadership. First, this CBR report should be rejected. It is 58 pages of negatives based on improbables. Second, and this is a personal observation, I have watched another impediment to pro progress during this entire process, and I will suggest that you give Louis Jordan another bonus, a one-way airline ticket. Thank you. Please come up to the microphone if you'd like to speak. Thank you. And if you can Hi. get in line, that would be even Three minutes. better. Thank you again. My name is Aura Hathaway, and I wanted to um, continue my personal story of uh, becoming a resident in public housing, which I had never thought I would ever do in my whole life. I did it because my mother was dying, and although I was offered Section 8 at the time and many other places to move into, this place was given to me. There was an elderly man downstairs who was very quiet and neighbors very calm. And, and I took the place. It was a beautiful place. I entered into hell. <laughs> I immediately became very sick. I couldn't breathe. It was drug smoke. I didn't even know what it was until I found out. I thought it was heroin. I thought it was other things. The other day I found out they're scraping fentanyl off patches and smoking it in public housing. I was threatened the first time I went outside. I tried to introduce myself and I was told by one of the residents, we don't want to know you, go in your house. My phone was stolen. I found syringes outside. The lights were being shot out by BB guns. And the kind people, the elderly people, were being threatened continually. I put my notice in to move in 2012. However, I was nominated by someone in Golden Gate Village, Isaiah Wallace, to sit on the resident council. At that time, they were calling it the agency wide. However, upon conversation with Gerald Went, who works for HUD, said there is no, nothing, no such thing called an agency-wide. You are a jurisdiction-wide resident council, and local resident councils also should be able to be your right as residents to have. Since 2012, I was elected um, in 2013 to be the president of the jurisdiction-wide resident council, which meant that I resided over all of the public housing and went to all of the complexes. Every six months we met at a complex, every six months. There's no way you can, can do any kind of programming if you only meet once every six months, two times in a year. Therefore, when David Levin asked me if I would make a deposition in a lawsuit, I said yes. Because I had experienced the ineffectual, the ineptness of Marin Housing Authority trying to force the Golden Gate Village Resident Council into oblivion. Force them to put everything they had into storage, which they're still paying for, took away their building and gave it to bridge the gap, and continue to do that. And then say, oh, see, you're doing nothing. You've done nothing. I would like to remind this board that there was a time when the executive director, I mean, Jan Schiller Miller, is that right? For 20 years, worked with the resident council, hired them to do the 
construct, could do the landscaping, the maintenance, and the place was a high performer. This is history that cannot be swept under the rug. Dan Ackerman <coughs> did not include the people in a plan that he made. I received that plan from Isaiah Wallace, which is why he nominated me to be on the board. He knew that I'd been in architecture, that I had an experience with historic preservation. I was the senior designer for All Souls Parish of Berkeley, which won an award. I understand how to run multi-million dollar projects, and I further went to study with Carol Gallant and Karen Chappelle, who did the gentrification study, Karen Chappelle, for Golden Gate Village. Or if you can wrap it up. I would like to say that upon meeting with Louis Jordan, he said to me in private, I'm gonna take all of the laws in the penal code and I'm gonna make lease violations. And he did. And these lease violations had been on the neck of the people, creating an almost like jail-like existence. While you, I went to the rap, and I said, Kimberly Carroll, will you please come and will you come and live just for a weekend and see what it's like to live in these places? They're telling us they're safe. They're not. So I'm just saying that we need a lot more light shed upon the Marin Housing Authority, their activities. I have been threatened. I was driven from my home. Marin Housing Authority allowed the person below so me to leave in the Trump Square aura stay out. I've been threatened, my life has been threatened. I have witnessed crime on there and I've now just asked for a lawyer and I'm going to go into the witness protection program because of the things that I've seen happen that I'm now going to come forward and talk about. Thank you. My name is Barry Fagan, I live in Green Brain. I'm an architect with a PhD in City and Regional Planning from UC Berkeley. I was previously Director of Development and Maintenance for the Housing Authority of the City of East St. Louis. I currently manage over 2,000 low-income units. I have read the CBR report and their initial contract with MHA. If, that's, if any of you have tried reading the report, you probably struggled as I did. It is written in appalling bureaucraties. And it's quite different from the presentation you saw today. The financial analysis is sketchy, and the risk analysis is completely missing. As uh, Ms. Connolly noted indirectly in his questions, and several others have observed. If I were in MHA, I would send the report back for a rewrite. As an architect, planner, and past professional in the public housing business, I believe that MHA should explore other low-cost rehabilitation options, such as making a re rehabilitation a job training program for residents and rehabilitating units as they become vacant. There are many such small-scale local possibilities to, that do not appear to have been considered and should be. Contractors here are hungry for skilled labor and pay well. Rehabilitating Marin City could be a golden opportunity for MHA to rethink how they go about their work and their broader mission, as Jared Huffman said in his letter, to strengthen our community. I did this in East St. Louis. I know it works and could happen here. Selling off the property or its development rights, doing large-scale demolition, entering risky financial partnerships with developers while applying, applying for low probability of success hard rad programs is not something I would put my money on just yet. As the board with fiscal responsibility, I think you should place your bets only after further internal due diligence. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I second what that gentleman said, and third and fourth. It was an important message. Uh, I was walking to this meeting this morning, and I happened to walk past a panel that had a picture of my boy Blake on it. And there was a quote on it that said, 
Here is a crucial opportunity to open the eyes of not Marin County alone, but of the entire country to what officials gathering together might themselves do to broaden and beautify human lives. This is a critical opportunity for you to do the right thing. My letter points out <coughs> what I, these are talented people, but they have not risen to their talents in this report. I don't know why, I don't know if the funding was enough. I know they got enough input. I know that we are in a critically dynamic environment, both in the local, state, and federal context in terms of funding. But I think the last thing that Marin City needs is a debt burden and increased privatization of how public housing is offered. The five of you on the Board of Supervisors are well familiar with the most recent, uh, five years ago, um, housing element that had 10 affordable units designated in Tan Valley. The people rose up with such fervor that that was removed as a possibility. Do you know where it went? A mile away, over the hill to Marin City. We cannot dump on Marin City anymore. We need to take this opportunity to preserve the incredible environment that has been down there. People respond to their environments. There is an opportunity to provide for a better way. And it's not by selling out. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Board. My name is Oshawa Diana Marcus. I am speaking here today as a former resident of Marin City. I grew up in public housing. My mother um, was there for 30 years, actually next door to Miss Small. We used to borrow sugar and desserts across the So I'm really speaking to the aspect, first of all, I want to really give, uh, pay homage to all the people who have stood before you today, speaking around Marin City and having this community continue to be the diverse community, and specifically an African American community in Marin. I believe that Marin County deserves that. It, it deserves a certain robustness in the makeup and the character of the county. So I, I just saw this this morning, and I just want to present this to the board. This says the Marin County-wide plan 2007. And what really struck me about it is planning sustainable communities, Marin City is left off completely. There's, there's no Marin City there. And it just is a little puzzling to me. I don't know where this came from. But I want to just say that people who are addressing you and who are coming from a place of maybe feeling a little paranoid or overly concerned have reasons. Things like this where we talk about sustainability, we talk about innovative manufacturing hubs, sustainability. There are people who are in Marin City now, who have grown up in Marin City, who are not living there now, who are entrepreneurs, who are manufacturers, who would love to be able to participate in a viable, economically rich, robust community. The economic dots separated from housing and affordable housing it just doesn't work. And we can see, we can go to South Africa, we can go to all other places where even though social equities came into play, without the economic dots connected to it, it just doesn't really work. So that's what I want to speak to is true sustainability around economic supporting of the manufacturing hub in Marin City so that we can really have some dignity in the community. That's right. Thank you.
My name is Nikki Allison. Um, I am, I gotta say, um, I live in Walnut Point Harbor. Um, I moved here in 2004, but I want to quickly tell you that I taught high school biology, AP, low income, uh, me, uh, low t ability, but turned out there were a lot of bright kids in the class, they just didn't have the motivation. I even taught in the community colleges. I am a school volunteer, I just noticed that I had put Bayside MLK a volunteer here, and I've been teaching the science, or helping with the science teacher in their science program. And I also volunteer for the Boys and Girls Club. <clears throat> and I have been doing my best to try and raise their curiosity. Yesterday they were floating caps and challenged each other to see how many pennies they could get in the caps. And it was wonderful. I am so impressed with my city. I live in Mar uh, Maryland, um, and there was no community involvement. Marin City is an involved community. I got to Asoji. I have been talking to people in the Marin uh, City uh, Community Service District. I'm sort of become their watchdog for developments. And the kids, the people, are smart. They're disadvantaged economically, but these are bright kids that I'm dealing with. Some of them more brilliant than kids I taught in high-income areas in Marin County, Maryland. So please, thank you so much for pointing out on that map that Marin City's not there. Because that is a viable community. Don't forget it and get them involved, please. Thank you. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, Damien Morgan. <clears throat> Born and raised in Marin City, uh, current uh, Golden Gate Village resident. Um, first, I want to say uh, also a newly elected uh, Marin City Community Service District Board member to be uh, sworn in Thursday. So, all of you are invited if you should care to come. Um, thanks to CBR, all your many hours. Thanks to uh, Lewis and Marin Housing. Thanks to RDJ. Thanks to the board here for all the hours and emails and all the, that good stuff. Um, first, I want to say, Marin City, we do value, we do love, we do appreciate open space. Um, every community does engage, it comes hard when it comes to open space, and we do value it. We love it, we appreciate it, and we respect our open space as we have it now. And we want to keep it that way. Um, as far as community engagement, I, I'm the person who emailed Dan, and I appreciate you understanding that, not rubber, stand, rubber stamping that community engagement piece. Um, it did lack, respectfully, it lacked. Um, there's a lot missing. Um, I've sang this song to you guys many times about community engagement. You heard it before from me, but I want to give you one last example of why it lacked a lot. Um, you, would, you would have to take an educated guess and say it's not by accident. This past Friday, we had a meeting, Friday night, 6 to 8, from Rent Housing, CVR, RDJ, there was not one piece of literature that went out to the community. Not one from RDJ, Rent Housing, and CVR. Not one piece of literature went out to the community. I live there, okay? That's on that community engagement piece. I was saying it before, and I want you to know it's very important. Um, as far as historical, well, as far as our placing affordable housing in Marin City, Marin City, we accepted and did our part as far as Marin County with pushing affordable housing in, in, in our community. In the mid-90s, Ridgeway Apartments were created. Ridgeway was built in the mid-90s, and I think that's our answer to affordable housing in Marin County. Let's continue to explore other communities in Marin with affordable housing. Um, not to put the bottle on uh, stands here, but last night I was doing my research. I saw um, 35 acres of open space available to be possibly split, subdivided. It's in the bottle, $1.7 million. Let's explore that. Um, so, you know, as far as so as far as Marine, Marine City already having Ridgeway, 
there was a case in Houston, I think it was Houston, Texas. Uh, it was, it was, I'm, I'm no lawyer, but I think you call it case law. Community members in Houston, Texas uh, fought the, the city, fought developers, and won um, a case in Houston, Texas that's now called call desperate impact. So to say that, you know, to force more affordable housing as we did in 95 in Red City, I think that does say to desperate impact in our community. We've already done it. We've been there. So please understand, we like open space. Marin City is already more dense than any other town. It's already more dense than any other town and city in Marin County. So make that clear. Marin City is more dense than any other town in Marin County as it stands today. Thank you for your time. I respectfully uh, ask you to reject the report as it is today. Thank you so much. Good morning, Barbara Bogard, Mill Valley. You know, there's a lot that I really treasure about Marin. And we're number one in some really important, significant ways that I value deeply. We're also, however, number one because we're the most racially unequal county in California. That to me is shameful. And it means that we have to change. I'm not blaming anybody for this. I'm not saying it's your fault. We all have to look at what we're doing, including we're in housing authority, look at what we're doing and how we can make decisions differently and do things differently so that we cannot stay number one in, in racial inequality. And one of the things that's pretty well agreed on in this field is that in order to make these changes, we need to listen to the communities of color. We need to hear their solutions. We need to let them lead. We have to stop telling them what we, white liberals, think is the best thing for them and let them lead. And I don't see that we're doing that in this situation. Um, when my, when I'm in Marin City and I hear the residents of Golden Gate Village look at this plan and say to me, this is gentrification. This will lead to the dissolution of the Marin County African, Amer of the Marin City African American community. I'm listening to that and I think we all need to. And when this plan includes, it, it's become, as Susan said, it's huge. Demolition of existing units, new construction, uh, this RAD funding, which is highly unlikely to happen. I don't understand how we can base something on RAD funding when the report, it, the, the report itself says, in referring to RAD funding, in most instances, these grants are not widely accessible to smaller housing authorities like Marin with limited resources. Um, I'm also not understanding, I, I'm seeing two different things. I'm hearing no, no displacement, but what I'm seeing is right to return. Those are two different things. Those are two very different things, and, and that's all I'm seeing written down is no permanent displacement and, and right to return. So I think that we need to listen to what the residents of Golden Gate Village are telling us. We need to give more than lip service to the goal of protecting Golden Gate Village house, the households. And we need to give more than lip service to community involvement. Let's do this right. Let's make this one of the ways that we stop being number one in racial inequality. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to turn back to CBR and 
directed toward bringing further thoughts or responding to the well, I can attempt to address. There were many, many comments, obviously, impassioned comments, concerned comments. Um, it's clear that we have a process where um, people are expressing their concern for the future of, of this community. Um, there, many of the things that were said, however, um, were issues that we tried to address. Um, obviously, we were limited in what we were supposed to do here. So many of the concerns, be they about um, resident employment, some of those things, um, the community, community land trust are addressed in the report in the appendices. Um, there are comments um, that were raised about um, RAD being risky or expensive. Um, there were comments about widespread demolition, um, comments about gentrification, which is a charged word. Um, <coughs> We did our very best to address these. We are not talking about widespread demolition. We are talking about the potential for some limited um, redevelopment in terms of new construction. And that was done in an effort to not move people off of the site. Um, uh, the last speaker, I believe, talked about utilizing the term of right of return. That's part of the, the rules of, of RAN, the right of return. In this case, we're not requiring, uh, we're providing a process, amending a process by which the residents do not have to leave the site. They may, at when the time comes, need to leave their unit. I know that there was talk about fix the units one at a time uh, once they're vacated. Um, I don't know how long that will take to address 300 units when there's a very low vacancy rate. And I don't know how that allows for you to address the major building systems uh, in any logical construction way. Um, so I understand that there are tremendous concerns. I don't think that there's a magic solution to say this is simple. It's not a simple problem. Um, what we do have that many communities do not have is a beautiful site, a, a lot of engagement. Um, structures that are already there and can be rehabilitated. You don't have the financial wherewithal to do what you would like to do. So therefore, um, in our process, we eliminated those that we felt were not the best solutions or viable solutions and tried to recommend what we felt was a scenario. It is not a plan. It is a starting point from which you would go forward to develop a plan with a development partner meeting the conditions, continuing the planning process, meeting the requirements that this agency would establish as to non-displacement of the site, keeping 296 units at the ACC level when it's transferred to the RAD program, um, but bringing in some additional opportunities, all still within an affordable housing component and then bringing in some limited market rate. What that would look like ultimately would still be part of a planning process. One of the speakers talked about the importance of continuing a planning process. This is, we were not tasked with developing a plan, we were tasked with analyzing options. Um, I know someone said we could have, I don't think they phrased it quite like this, but we could have simply said no and no. Uh, I don't think that would have served this agency or this community very well by simply saying we don't think either one is going to happen, it's not really feasible. Um, I think part of our role was to provide some potential solutions of how to address what we think is a significant problem and yet one with options um, that can be addressed to maintain what is a historically significant site which we do recognize. I don't know if Dan or anyone else has. I'd like to add something as well. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I appreciate the comments and the and we look forward to continuing to find ways 
to communicate and educate collectively on this process. Many of the comments, many of the concerns that have been brought forth can and will be addressed once the planning process starts. I strongly feel that this consulting team delivered on what we asked. What were the most feasible options as we go forward? How do we do that without, without displacing people? How do we do that by valuing the cultural history of the community? And I think it's been done. There, there's been a tremendous amount of opinion and we should have done that. And why don't you think about this? And I, I say to this board, in a planning process, there will be ample time to address those issues. There will be ample time for additional community support. But my position now as it was at the beginning of this presentation, we need to have direction in starting the planning process so that we can get to a point of a redevelopment strategy. Thank you. Commissioner O'Donnell. Could you just comment again, since the RAD program is such an important part of your recommendation, the risk around RAD that we heard of the speakers, and also the availability of RAD? Again, um, RAD is a program, it's a demonstration program, but one that is, has been increasing in the number of units being converted to RAD. Um, and you need to put your name in as a housing authority and say, we want to do this, whether it's for your entire portfolio or for a particular project um, that you envision as converting to RAD, do that a public housing community generally. Um, it, the people spoke about the funding from RAD. They, I want to be clear, RAD does not, converting to RAD does not bring you any additional dollars from HUD. It takes the HUD would calculate right now for building a village, you get so much money for operating subsidy, you get so much money for capital <coughs> programs. It totals X. We will now give you X in one bundle in a under the RAD program, um, and you have discretion on how you use it. So you have greater flexibility. Um, you are now allowed to bring in a process of bringing tax credit equity, bringing in um, other investments to make the repairs or the development that you seek to do. HUD is involved in every step of that process. It's not like you have an open-ended opportunity here to do whatever you want. HUD is engaged in every single step of that process, reviewing what your proposals are, how will they be done, what are you seeking to do. It is also important to note, um, and I'm not trying to be disparaging of any housing authority, but there are housing authorities that simply say to a developer, tell me what to do. Uh, one of the key things that we are proposing here or suggesting here is that you do not do a request for proposals where people come in and tell you I've got this idea, but rather you establish very clearly what the parameters of what this agency is looking for and then you request uh, qualifications to identify which firms you feel are able to do this work and you're able to work with. Um, and typically you rank them and if you cannot get that top-ranked firm to agree to the conditions that you set. You just don't negotiate with them. You move on to number two. Um, but part of it, I believe Tanya had referenced, um, including our report as part of the parameters of what would be required. Um, so it is a very clearly established in the report that the 296 existing units would remain at that, that tier level. Uh, I know you want to say something. Go ahead. I just wanted to, to very specifically clarify the, the question, the response of your particular question. Um, one, in the report when we were talking about RAD and how RAD is not the single solution, that was the purpose of that particular, so, so we heard a lot of people talk about how they felt like there was some conflicting information and I think part of that is because RAD is not the only solution. It, it by itself will not produce for you everything that you want and want to finance. It is a, you know, a tool 
that is available that is very accessible to all housing authorities. And in fact, as we've said a number of times, right, it is public housing for the 21st century. It is the way that HUD is leaning and pushing. If you, if you go to conferences and you hear HUD talk, they push RAD. They push every housing authority to fully look at and investigate and perform feasibility studies on RAD because they understand that RAD is the way that public housing authorities will be funded in the future. And so, you know, it's not conflicting per se, it's just, it's not a single solution. I think we've said that a number of times. And, and if I could make a distinction, for example, there are communities where there is no potential of investment from the private sector. There is no potential of loans to rehabilitate properties. Uh, because there would be no potential of repayment. Um, so um, without going into it, there are communities that we're currently working at with HUD um, where HUD is simply saying, this is done. Uh, converting to RAD or saying it, it's not, we, we're going to give vouchers to people and the public housing in this community is over. Um, in this case, we are talking about a community that not only has a beautiful site and tremendous opportunity to do something strategically done as, as respecting the history as Dan referenced, but where you have income opportunities, where you have potential to do the, uh, the, the kind of repairs you want to do and create the kind of community everyone here wants to create it um, with funding opportunities that can arise through a combination. Mixed finance really is a combination of financing sources. So some of it would be whatever you currently receive from the capital program, but some of it would be tax credits, some of it would be grants, uh, competitive programs, if the county or the state have programs that you go after, you can bundle all of those together to address each phase. And that's the opportunity you have that many other places don't. Commissioner Sears. Great, right, so I, wonder, I really want to start by acknowledging the expertise of the consultants who've worked on this project. I really think that your experience and expertise has been very helpful and informative for us. And I also want to really acknowledge and thank uh, everyone who's spoken here today, but more broadly, everyone who's been involved in the process of uh, providing input and thoughts and recommendations about what's the best way forward uh, for Marin City and Golden Gate Village since 2015 and really going back to 2009, even before my time on the board. So there are four things that are particularly important to me. And the first is improving the quality of housing uh, available to Golden Gate Village residents. I refuse to condemn any of our residents to living in housing that continues to deter deteriorate. That is absolutely unacceptable. The second thing that's important to me it, it's, is that it's extremely important that existing residents are not displaced or relocated outside of Marin City. And we've heard a lot about that today, and I really appreciate the consultants hearing those concerns and coming up with ideas in, a, in an attempt to address it. Um, to me, providing a right of return guarantee is not good enough. We've seen that uh, in prior development uh, incidents, let's call them, or uh, examples, and it's resulted in disruption of community. I do not want that to happen here to the city. Any plan that's developed in the future must allow residents to remain on site or in the community. Third, I think it's extraordinarily important that we recognize the historical significance of Gold, Golden Gate Village. And as the report notes, there are specific processes involving CEQA, the California Environmental and Quality Act, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and Secretary of Interior Standards that will ensure that that happens. We must make sure that the historic significance of this property is respected uh, in whatever plan is told them. And fourth, um, uh, you know, I think it will come as no surprise to anybody, given my focus on the environment, that I think the green design goals are really terrific and are a key part of achieving a truly forward-looking revitalization of Golden Gate Village. You know, the financial realities and challenges are sobering, but there are also really exciting possibilities here. Golden Gate Village was a model for public housing when it was first built. And, I, and let's make sure that we find a way to revitalize this housing so it can be a new model for affordable housing today and into the future. Doing nothing has consequences and has significant consequences. 
Um, as one of our speakers said, we are in a dynamic environment, which is probably the most polite description of the Trump administration that I have ever heard. <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, uh, and there's a lot of financial risk potential that needs to be carefully considered and addressed. And we also need to make sure that we are creating a sustainable community. I think Oshala said it extremely well uh, of underlining the importance of that goal. There's a lot of useful information in this report, um, including um, that was going, going to be helpful for us in the process going forward. And that process must include a more complete development of a realistic funding plan. I think that's why you would do it on any project once you engage a developer, whether a nonprofit <coughs> or a for profit developer. You have to figure out really realistically. We have a lot of good platform ideas here but that's something that needs to be developed with a lot more attention. Um, and we really need to have the specifics of a plan to focus discussion going forward. And I think uh, it's, that's certainly what the recommendation of how we should proceed is intended uh, to get, get us to the next step, create a plan, get better focused, or more, do a deeper dive on financials, and really make sure that we, are, we have a plan going forward where we can take action. Um, as I said before, I, I, what's really probably in some ways most important to me is making sure that everyone in Merth City has the quality of housing to live in that they deserve. And right now, we don't have that. And the longer we wait, the greater and more deterioration there is, and the more unfair that community there is. So I think there's been great work done. There's a lot more work that needs to be done going forward, but we need to move forward. Looking to see additional uh, comments or questions, Commissioner Hall. Uh, I would just like to comment. Uh, I, uh, I'm a long time resident of Marine City. In fact, I got here in 1953. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who spoke about Ms. Small and most of the people that uh, I'd like to say this that spoke about Ms. Small, probably speaking from the standpoint of what they read, but I grew up with Miss Small, living next door to her in shipyard housing. Miss Small was actually the babysitter for me and my sister. I grew up with, when Miss Small had three kids, Bobby Charles, Flora, and Ernest Jr., mm -hmm. who was my best friend. This was before she had any grandkids. But Miss Small was like a second mother to me and my sister, because my mother was able to go to work, and uh, she would just leave the door open because that back in then you could just leave your door open and people go in and out. So Miss Small would watch us, and she would make sure that we got to school, which we walked down to school in in Marin City. But what I want to say is, a lot of people that spoke about Miss Small had no idea who Miss Small was. They just pretty much were going on what they know from last year, a few years before. I lived in that house, I ate in that house. The small spanked me. She did everything a mother would do for us. So uh, yeah, I have mixed feelings about Miss Small. And my concern is her well-being and that maybe she'll live to be a hundred or two hundred as far as I'm concerned. But now moving fast forward, I was like, I heard a lot of people talk about uh, that don't live in Marin City, that are not African Americans, that here to support Marin City saying all these things about Marin City. But I remember when, uh, specifically in Greenbrae, when a black person couldn't live in Greenbrae. See, I grew up under this watching this. I remember when my first cousin, Glenn Robinson, was having trouble buying a house in Mill Valley. I remember going to school and being called an N-word in, in Mill Valley. So, and I see all these people come in with this agenda-driven thing saying, oh, don't move, don't, don't do anything to Marin City, but what really is going on is, I, I don't see anybody here when we have this Ackerman NIMBY standing up saying, hey, why won't we build affordable housing all over Marin County? So there's always the pushback. But what I'm saying is I really appreciate the work that uh, 
CBRD and, and with the uh, taking in consideration uh, with all the stuff, uh resistance to affordable housing and considering the fact that Marin City, we need to build something first and guarantee that the residents will not be moved. We've heard this uh, before that uh, when they redeveloped and I we, and they developed Golden Gate Village. A lot of people talk about Golden Gate Village. Well, I lived in Golden Gate Village before it was named Golden Gate Village. In fact, we were probably one of the first 10 families to move in over there in the grand opening. You can look in the archives and verify that. So what I want to say is uh, I really appreciate the report. I think uh, that uh, Scenario B is a great chance for for the people of the community to collaborate and build on it. I think uh, there should be some discussion on it, but uh, I would just say that uh, something needs to be done because if nothing is done, we'll end up, housing thought it will be a slumlord. So uh, basically, you know, we get this, uh, 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 people saying, oh, uh, don't do anything because they don't want you to move into their neighborhood. And they're supporting it, yes. They're supporting it to stay like it is. But so I would suggest uh, that uh, we move forward with this and give Lewis the authority to move forward to get a developer and then have some more, hold more meetings in Moran City with the community to get a collaboration and maybe improve some of the things that are not, that they don't like about it, you know, so that we can get to a happy meeting. So something can be done because we've done a lot of talking. We hear pros and cons. I've heard, uh, uh, actually, I've heard uh, people from legal aid say this and say that. Actually, I sat on that board before I became a commissioner. Their track record on getting uh, on housing discrimination throughout this county is not very good. I think they need to work on that too. So, uh, you know, so I just sit here and it's just be following me to hear that. I've heard people say, oh, the people are concerned about fears. Well, no, they're concerned. They don't have any fears. What the problem is, is they're getting misled and misinformation. You know, and so we, I know this because I live there and I hear it. People just don't want to be, lose their home. And we need to guarantee that, that nobody will be moved out. So the simple process is to build something so that people, when they start to develop, people can move here and they can move back. We've seen this scenario before when they did uh, the rehab in the inside of the house, they put it in the cabinet. Nobody had to move. There was units that were offline. They were moving to the units. When the unit was ready, they moved back. And this process went on until they put in these cabinets and counties. It can be done. So to, just to say, oh, no, uh, people are going to be what I need won't come back. No, that's not true. So thank you. Homer suggested we go forward. I second that. Uh, Commissioner Hall has had a motion. That's a motion. Commissioner Simon, second. Commissioner Hall. I just have a, a very quick thing, and thank you, Homer, for your comments. Um, I think that the Commissioner Sears said it well. We cannot go backward and we can't go forward. And our job is to keep the balance between progress and protection. And I think this report does that. I support it. One thing I would ask you is it would be it would be good if you could get some photographs of rad projects that are built that maybe we could see firsthand. Absolutely. I think as a part as we move towards the yeah. development process, um, whomever as a group of community we select, that could be one of the, the number one things that we do. Give examples good. of what you know that looks like. But I, I just caution just from an education communication standpoint, rather than something that'll make it no, look different on its own. It's just, but I guess we can do that. Commissioner Wright. 
Um, I, yeah, so thank you, um, CDR, and the whole team for your work on this, and all the community members that have participated up to this point. And um, it's, it's an understatement to say that this is a challenging assignment um, in terms, I mean, just the, the physicality of the facility that we're, we're having to work with, um, the economics of it, and, um, you know, the social and community issues. And I, I really think that what you have at this high level um, seeks to address all of all three of those areas and and take in the concerns and comments that have been coming in through the through the through the process and obviously there's going to be a lot more. I just want to concur with all the, the comments that were made by Supervisor Sears and really appreciate Homer's comments and lived experience and just just because he's a wonderful person. Um, and then I I want to just emphasize um, something I have, don't think we talk about enough. Um, I've heard enough about today and talk about enough generally uh, around this whole revitalization project. It's about um, future generations. We we can't, the status quo is not all right in terms of health and safety for the current <coughs> residents. We certainly, and it should be at the utmost priority of not to displace folks as we go through this revitalization. But we need to remember this is about the long view. This is about the next generation and the next generation of people who are going to need housing. We cannot lose this housing. And we need to not only preserve, but also maximize opportunities. So let's remember it's not just about us and the current residents, but it's about um, the decades going forward and people who are going to need housing going forward. And the, and the, um, Sanctity and stability and sustainability of a community. So anyway, I'm, I'm on board. Mr. Simon, any additional thoughts? Okay, Mr. Uh, I'll try and be brief. I do want to second uh, Commissioner Sears' comment. Also, thank the staff and, and CDR for the report. You know, it's obvious that under any option or any scenario, federal funding is never going to be enough. I think that's the real apparent thing, and I think we all recognize that. And I think while you're proposing financing mechanisms, that they very well may evolve and change in the next few months, next year, so, so we need to be flexible around those. But given our promise that no voluntary displacement is important to us and is something that we're demanding in this project, and the magnitude of the work that needs to be done, it appears the bill first option may be the only option. And, and I think your conclusion is probably right on. But we do need to move through the, to the next process, which is the RFQ, where we continue to develop those possibilities and those options. So I'm very supportive of that, and I want to thank you all for your presentation. And finally, yes. Mr. Chairman, if, if the board is mm -hmm. so moved to accept the report, it needs to be accepted with clarification. Okay, so the motion will reflect. Yeah. <laughs> and I would simply concur in the thanks uh, for the work and to the community um, and to my colleagues. And really start with the observation that Marin City is an amazing community that we value and cherish and really is part of the fabric of Marin. We need to do right by the residents of Marin City, and we will do so. Um, as was noted, this is not a plan. Um, it's a concept at this point. Um, it's a scenario. And uh, we heard assurances that going forward, there will not be displacement of residents. We've heard loud and clear today, as well as meeting with residents in Marin City and beyond, uh, that there cannot be displacement that we need to essentially uplift the residents of Marin City, not displace them. Uh, and that's going to be important going forward. I think the residents, uh, we didn't necessarily focus on it a lot today, but the residents have added a lot of other great ideas that I'm sure will be more fully vetted, like the manufacturing hub, um, like taking any opportunities uh, going forward to enhance economic opportunity and jobs uh, right there in the community. So we'll be focusing on that <coughs> as well. So the motion in second is on the acceptance of CBR uh, Golden Gate Village Feasibility Assessment and directing staff to publish a request for qualifications uh, going forward. And that's an acceptance with verification. Correct. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So I'm going to carry Thank you, everyone.
Yeah. Let's take five. 